Welcome to More Than a Mission, a podcast where we explore what it looks like to discern God's calling to live an active, intentional life of sharing the gospel. Each week, we talk about the way God is moving in our lives, around the world, and everywhere in between, as well as how God's call to missions may apply to your life. Ready to explore your calling? Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the More Than a Mission podcast. Uh, We've got another special guest here with us today. Uh, but first, thank you once again to the workout machine, Andrew Carlberg, for joining us. Hey, guys. How you doing? And the man with the crazy awesome tattoo idea, Zaya Henderson. <laughs> What's up, guys? We've got another guest joining us today, a very special guest, um, our very own admissions advisor, Austin Olsh. Austin, thanks for joining us. Hey, glad to be here, man. You got my last name right. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I've talked to you a couple times now. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> awesome. We are super excited to have you joining us today uh, to go over all things world race and to talk about how exactly the world race is this life-changing mission trip that uh, the organization promotes it to be. Uh, we've had some super awesome discussions with you. I know I have individually and you've joined uh, one of our squad uh, Zoom calls as well to talk about the world race. So we're su- super excited yeah. to to hear your story and for you to be able to share that with everyone else. Sweet. I'm glad to share. Um, before we dive into the, the deep details, could you give us just a little bit of background uh, on yourself? You know, where are you from, where you're living now, all that good jazz? Yeah, uh, so I grew up in central Pennsylvania, uh, Harrisburg area, so about three hours from Pittsburgh, three and a half hours from Philadelphia, um, born and raised there um, till I actually did the world race in 2012. Then I um, did my 11-month trip, uh, life-changing, you know, we'll get into that. Um, and then I moved down to Georgia to partner with Adventures and Missions, um, basically a few months after I got back from my world race trip. Uh, I moved down there to do our discipleship program, and then I've been working with them for the past eight or nine years. So now I'm a, officially a Southerner, um, living in Georgia, uh, official residence and all that jazz. So, uh, yeah, that's where I'm from. This is where I'm at. Nice. Very nice. So in, in prior episodes, uh, Andrew, myself, and, and Zaya have shared that, like, where we're currently at in, in life uh, before we head out on our 11-month world race journey. So we're mm-hmm. all we've all graduated from college. Uh, we're all working now. Where were you at in life before you did your world race journey? Yeah, same spot. <laughs> I, uh, so I actually found the race uh, when I was about to graduate college. I was like, man, I want to do something. I want to get out of my hometown because I grew up in my hometown, like high school, college, everything. And so I was like, I want to just get out of here for like a year before I jump into work and whatever that looks like. Um, and then realized I had to fundraise like you know thousands of dollars to do it and was like oh maybe that's not what I wanted <laughs> and so, um, ended up not not doing with the world but felt kind of a calling to it um, my senior year of college um, ended up graduating getting a job uh, loved my job absolutely loved it but a about a year into it a series of circumstances happened that uh, that made me rethink like is my life on the path that the Lord wants it on you know Um, again, I love my job, loved what I did, but I was like, I just had this feeling like there's more, like the Lord had more for me. And like, it wasn't just this, my job, which again, I enjoyed my coworkers, what I did, but I was like, it's, there's just this yearning, like there's more. Um, and so I I don't know how, but the Lord brought the world race back up into my life. And I remember watch, I watched a a promo video and it just like hooked my heart. I was like, like this is it like this this is what is the lord is calling me to and um through so many series of of things that happened um the lord just confirmed like this is what he was he was calling me into um so they applied you know got accepted and then i told my parents which in (laughs) retrospect was uh probably the best decision the best way it could have gone uh but they were not not on board right away um, so it took some, some, a lot of prayer and uh, convincing for them. But um, then about a year later, I launched on my world race trip. So basically, same as you guys, it came out of work and was like, you know, there's something more here. And, uh, you know, 
changed my life and haven't looked back. I yeah, definitely applied so. and told my parents also. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, I yeah. get it. <laughs> yeah. So before we get into like your race itself, we also had an episode a few ago um, on like fundraising. Mm-hmm. So is there anything from your like your fundraising journey that like stands out as just like an awesome moment? Or like a challenging moment of just like how you saw the Lord work leading up to going. Um, I mean, for me, the Lord, he, he just showed up in, in amazing ways when it came to fundraising. Like it was one of those things for my journey with Lord, it was my family, once they were on board, like my mom was a huge advocate and helped out a ton. Um, the Lord previous, like he was setting me up for this before I even went, like I started a youth leader job at a church 45 minutes from my house. So I was very active in my home church, but then I was, active in this other church and so I had two support bases to pull from um, in that regard that the Lord had already set up for me um, and so he just provided above and beyond like I I raised maybe twenty thousand dollars for my race um, and you know that was I was that at that time that was maybe five thousand dollars over what I needed um, wow and so the Lord just provided above and beyond um, so I could be provided for and then it was awesome because then I could access funds like I was I was able to bless people. So while we were on the world race trip, like I was able to purchase beds for a ministry because they were in need of beds because the Lord provided these funds. And so it was like this, this kind of blessing fund that I got to operate out of, which was pretty cool. But the pattern in my life, the Lord always provides more in the current season than, than is necessary to cover whatever's coming next in my life. And that's just been a pattern of, of the Lord showing up in my life. So, um, I mean, it was, challenging but i had a lot of support which is super beneficial so i spoke in churches like i spoke in five different churches um with random people's connections and you know sent out support letters and calling people talking to people presenting um doing fundraisers like the whole nine yards so it was a lot of work but the lord was it was just he was so gracious in it and it was really awesome yeah that's super cool and also super encouraging especially for me as someone who is not done fundraising yet, contrary to Andrew and Zaya. <laughs> but it's also super encouraging to hear like your story and transition into the world race. Um, just because I'm in such a, like a relatable place in the sense that I've already finished college. I started working my career and ultimately just feel called to more. And as crazy as that is for like people to think, because essentially I had done everything right societally, right? Like I went to school, got a good job, but it just, I know what I was feeling called to more and to hear that following God's calling is the best choice and absolutely works out is, is super encouraging. Oh, a hundred percent. Like I, you know, it's not, it's not successful to do what what we're what you guys are about to do you know to to quit your jobs to leave the country for a year leave friends family comforts uh raise all this money you know it's not successful in the world as and it's confusing to people they don't understand but when you like the kingdom of god is very countercultural. i mean you just look at so much in the bible like jesus was very countercultural, um and so a lot of the things that are held dear in the secular world in in general um doesn't are very opposite of what the kingdom is and so um yeah so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense but like i you know i've i've been fundraising since 2011 since i did i did my race in 2012 so i've been fundraising since 2009 because i fundraise to do what i do with adventures and mission so i've been doing that for (laughs) nine almost 10 years now you know that's not normal so to speak you know but i wouldn't trade it for the world like do i i make a ton of money no but i wouldn't trade my job for anything because i love what i do like i love getting to disciple people to help launch people into the kingdom to have a life-changing experience like i did like it's there's so much fulfillment in it like it's not about the paycheck which is counter to what a lot of the world says so um Again, if you follow the Lord, like he'll provide, like you don't, you know, he's a good dad. He is infinitely rich. Like he provides for his kids um, and us as his sons and daughters, like he, he'll provide like, and if you're following him, you know, scripture says like, he, you know, he provides for the birds of the air 
and everything and all, nature and everything like that but you know how much more is he going to provide for you his his beautiful creation that he breathed life into so it takes faith and it's challenging and it's stretching but it's you know it's worth it absolutely absolutely right thank you so much for sharing that and for all you world racers that are in the process of fundraising or your future world racers listen to austin he knows what he's talking about <laughs> for real though austin you've been super helpful throughout this preparation journey so i'm very thankful to have a resource like you yeah glad to help with that being said let's jump in and hear about your world race experience austin so what 11 countries did you go to on your world race Oh, so my race, it was the best route, in my opinion. <laughs> um, it's just like, I see so many routes, I'm like, my race was, was baller. Uh, we started in the Dominican Republic, uh, and then went to Haiti. And then up to Europe, we went to Moldova and Romania. Um, and then we went to Africa for Swaziland, Mozambique, and South Africa. Um, and then Asia for... India, Nepal, China, and then we ended in the Philippines. Oh, wow. Okay, that, that is a pretty sweet yeah. route. Yeah, You're touching a lot all. of different places there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dang. So, like, yeah. oh, there's so many questions that we could, like, ask to get into it. I think for starters, uh, before, like, hearing, I don't know how, like, long-term things for you specifically, like, even just thinking about like how ministry looks so different around the world, were there like things you noticed between say Central America, Europe, Africa, and Asia that were just like different or like what you weren't expecting going in? Uh, yeah. Like I didn't, hadn't really had much international experience before doing the world race, um, especially in any missions uh, standpoint at all. But the, how cultures like cultures are so different like if you've never traveled it's it's so interesting because the dominican republic which is probably one of my favorite places was the people were so welcoming you know regardless of whether christian or not christian like because we did a lot of evangelism and things like that the culture was like everyone had like lived in smallish huts where we were but they all had like five or more like plastic lawn chairs that they just had in their house because it's such a communal culture. Like you're walking by and they wave you, the, you into the yard and they pull out chairs. And if you don't have enough, like they yell over to their neighbor, you know, 20 yards away and like, Hey, I need some chairs. And they bring the chairs over and you just, you sit and you have conversation and you eat food. And it's such a welcoming, nurturing, open culture. Um, and that was awesome. So that was like month one. And I'm like, this is, I was like, these people are so great. Like it's, it's, it's fantastic. So, um, yeah, East culture is different. Like the DR was very much like that. Um, you know, China, which is a closed country for us. Like you can't openly be a missionary there. Very different. Like you can't evangelize. You have to do what we call friendship evangelism. Um, where you go and you, you make friends with people. Um, and through the, getting to know people and they ask questions you ask questions like you share your faith um and so each each kind of area of the world is different africa again different culture welcoming but like the traditions there are very are very different too and so it's just like everything is so different from culture to culture but at the same time the themes are also so similar so there's so many differences but it also it's like the Lord is working each and every culture in very similar ways, you know, through just prayer and connecting with people and the impact of just loving people where they're at. And so like, they're so vastly different, but also has so much similarity. It's, it's this weird dynamic that you run into the more you travel, like the more you travel, the, the smaller the world really becomes. So with that, I think, <laughs> Something that I know and, and and am anticipating is like the need to lay down any expectation going in. And so I'm curious if you had like any expectations going in that you felt like you had to wrestle with or lay down prior to or like even while you were on the field. Oh, yeah. Um, 
I mean, trying to do life without expectations is hard, but so necessary, especially for the world race, because things can change on the daily, you know, and it's just around the world, things operate so differently than America, typically, um, in a lot of, like, it's just very foreign. So, you know, in Africa, for example, relationships with people are Trump uh, timeliness. So, like, if you're having a conversation, if me and you're having a conversation, Andrew, but I have a meeting with Micah at, you know, 2 p.m. in the afternoon, and right now it's like 1.55, I'll keep talking to you for another 30 minutes, hour, two hours, and that will trump being on time for a meeting with mm-hmm. Micah. Whereas in the U.S., like, we're about schedules. Like, you, you aren't late to things. Like, you, you have an appointment, you say you're going to be there, you're going to be there. Where Africa, in a lot of, or at least the areas I've traveled, is more relational. Like, you the relationship is more important than timeliness. And so, you know, church, you know, people say, you know, church starts at 10 and people roll in around noon, you know, a service starts around one and then it goes till 6 PM. Like, it's just, it's just crazy. And that's a lot of cultural stuff, but you have to go in with, it's so hard because we're so indoctrinated with the just an American mindset and like lenses of our culture, which is normal. And so you have to, you have a lot of, expectations that you actually don't realize you have until they're not met and that's the biggest struggle is like you can try and be like okay i'm gonna lay down my expectations for what the next 11 months are are gonna look like or what this culture is gonna look like or whatever and there's a lot that you can do proactively but a lot of times it's not until an expectation is not met that you are like oh crap i i like you're hurt or you're you're angry you're upset for something and you have to kind of check yourself like why and it's typically because an expectation that you didn't know you had, you had, it wasn't met. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, I mean, that's just good for all of life, but especially when traveling in different cultures, different countries. Um, one of the things that was just my personal walk with the Lord, like I was, um, a lot of what we talk about in the world race is identity. You know, what's it mean to be a man of God, a woman of God? What's it mean to walk in your identity as, as a son and daughter? And a lot of us are, through our experiences, through our, our culture, through our upbringing, are walking in a lot of lies that we're believing about ourselves or about the Lord or about any number of things. Like maybe I just don't believe that I'm worthy to be loved. Like that could be a lie that I'm believing, or I don't believe that, that like God cares about everyone else, but doesn't really care that much about me. You know, there's so many lies that a lot of times we believe that we don't realize it. And those need to be, um, broken down and replaced with the truth of what the father actually says you are and what scripture says you are, that you are a son or a daughter of the most high God who loves you because he loves you because you're a son and that's it. You don't have to do anything to earn that love. Um, and I was, I remember kind of going out thinking like, all right, I need to be broken down to be built back up. Like, like Lord. And I was my prayers were like, Lord, break me down. Like show me these things that I'm walking in that aren't true and break them. So you can then build it like the, the idea of a foundation, like, build me a firm foundation on top of all the stuff that you've broken off. Um, and that was my expectation. Like, all right, Lord, like break me, <laughs> you know? And it wasn't until the, I think month two or more that I wasn't really listening. I was just praying to God and not really listening for his response. It was in month two that I remember the Lord saying back to me, like, stop praying to be broken. Like I'm trying to build you up, not trying to break you. Like you already have a good foundation. Like I want to build on what you already have. Stop praying for me to break things down that don't need to be broken. And so like all my energy is going thinking of, of like, I need to get rid of the stuff that's not true. And the Lord's like, you have a good foundation. You know about sonship and who you are. I want to build upon that. And so that was a mind shift. Like my expectation had changed through, oh, the Lord actually, he wants to build me up from where I'm at because like I grew up in a, an amazing household. My, my parents are amazing. My grandparents, like I grew up in the church and I had identity of the Lord instilled in me from, from birth. And so I actually had this really amazing foundation that was already built because of the way my parents and grandparents and my church walked out their faith and poured that into me. And so the Lord is like, I just want to build you up. And so for me, that's the biggest thing that stands out. Like I had an expectation, like, all right, break me down Lord so you can build me back up and Lord's like I just want to build me up stop trying to like you're going the opposite direction um so yeah that's the biggest thing for my trip that really stood out when it came to expectations that's such a good reminder though I think 
a lot of the times I tend to, to think that as well is like, Lord, like, like you were just saying, break me down. But I was kind of the, the same as you where I, I grew up in the church and, and believe that I do have a, a very solid foundation. And so it's not always that I need the Lord to break down the things that I think he needs to and, and just let him work in me and through me. Yeah. And it's all about his timing. Like, over the past eight years, like there's so much that I've walked through when it comes to just healing in my own life. And so like it's, you know, the Lord has his timing is perfect for every, every season of life. And so it really ends up being doing this and like, all right, Lord, I trust you. And I want you to do what you want to do, not doing what I think you want me to do or (laughs) doing what I want to do. Like getting out of our own way and letting the Lord do what he wants to do is I think some sometimes one of the hardest things to do because we think we we know what's best but in reality the lord actually know what's best for us absolutely austin as far as your uh, world race trip went what kinds of ministries were you exposed to during your trip oh a bunch of things i actually ended up doing a lot of like manual labor ministry uh just how it worked out um but month one was all evangelism. So we were going to churches, we were evangelizing, we were encouraging people in the community, loving on people. Um, we did some murals and stuff like that um, as well. Month two in Haiti was just construction. We were like laying cement and concrete and mixing, like hand mixing cement and concrete for an orphanage that we were helping to build. And so it was a lot of like hard manual labor work. Um, and then um, DR, Haiti, um, oh, Romania, more uh, relational ministry against Friend of the Gospel up there in, in Europe. Um, Moldova was a similar thing. Um, one of the things that was interesting that I did in Moldova is we dug a grave for a, a brother in the community who passed away. <laughs> that was very wow. interesting um because you know they don't have they i mean they didn't have backhoes and huge machinery to do this sort of thing so a brother in the community died we had the funeral and then we part of what we did is we helped if we were living with the pastor and we helped you know dig the grave to to bury the brother of the community so that was a first for me yeah probably Um, not something that you expected to be doing not at all no um but you run into a lot of that on the race like the (laughs) unexpected it tends to becoming the norm um so many times uh but so a lot of racial um africa is a lot of uh evangelizing a lot of going out and they do a lot of crusade-esque things going out to to communities setting up speakers doing live worship inviting the community out sharing the gospel preaching the message um and you know baptizing people all that stuff so africa is a big place for a lot of evangelism um and and working on that that's most of what my africa was and then Asia, um, we, we partnered with a long-term missionary in uh, China, and we helped to kind of furnish and build out and paint and finish a, uh, uh, their apartment that they were moving into because they were, they were kind of a hub for ministry um, in the area, and they were just moving into new apartments. So some of us helped to kind of help them finish it off and use some, some construction stickers to do that, which is great. Um, and then Philippines, we worked with an orphanage. So loving on the kids, you know, letting them pull your hair and <laughs> and picking them up. And um, word of warning, if you're at an orphanage and there are a lot of kids, if you pick one kid up or like, you know, throw one kid in the air, mm-hmm. we'll all want to be yep. thrown in the air. <laughs> so if you open that can of worms, you just be prepared, you know. Um, just throwing it out there because that's that's a thing. <laughs> if you do it for one, you got to do it for all of them. Uh, but in Asia, we helped out with uh, yeah, with a lot of uh, orphan care and again more evangelism and things like that. So it was kind of spread across a lot of uh, relational ministry. We did some basketball ministry in the Philippines, um, so sports outreach ministry, which is an avenue to also do Bible studies because we did the Bible study before the sports stuff. So it was a an avenue of evangelism for the local community. A lot of the kids in the community. So a lot of relational stuff, a lot of physical stuff, really like the heart, and this is more behind the scenes, like the heart of what we do as ventures in our, our ministry partners is we want to bring lift to ministries that are already doing stuff, mainly locals and churches. 
like we don't want to go and start our own thing and then leave like we want to bring lift to whoever's there doing the stuff day in day out 365 so usually we, we end up coming in and checking in um like a month before getting into where we're going for our ministry and saying like hey what do you guys need like some people like hey we actually need this part of the orphanage just like deep cleans um and maybe some murals painted awesome we'll do that you know we need people to help with care for the kids at lunch and dinner times awesome we'll do that and we need this construction we need we we just need people to go out and to be spreading the gospel like great that's what we're here for so a lot of it ends up being like what is the needs of the ministry while you're there and this having willing hands and and willing hearts to say all right lord like you sent me i'm here and now i'm gonna say yes to what what you have for me so yeah i think one thing that i know you shared on uh the zoom call that we had with our squad and is what i'm gonna have to like it's gonna take some getting used to for me is that we're not on like a set schedule as you were talking about before. Uh, and I know you mentioned, like, just as you were saying, you know, you might be needed to help out during lunch and during dinner. And it's not like this nine to five ministry that I guess, yeah. I don't know. I think I just have it in my head because that's my schedule here. So that's going to be, be hard for me to adjust to. Well, I shouldn't say hard. It's going to be different. Maybe it'll be yeah. super easy to adjust to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For those people who like schedules, like I'm one of those people, like I love me a good schedule. Like I wake up, I work out, I, yeah, I shower, I spend time with the Lord, I work nine to five, I come, like, love it, love it to death. I am, but for those people who do, who work in schedules, like it's a lot challenging because it could be different day to day, month to month, you know, whatever. You could have ministry in the morning and not the evening, in the evening and not the morning, in the morning and in the evening with a gap in the middle, like, <laughs> um you know sometimes you're going late night till you know midnight or two in the morning you know doing crusades in in africa and just sharing the gospel because they just can go on they can work forever uh in africa like they'll go on for hours and hours so <laughs> it's like you think worship service is, is long here in the states sometimes like no nope, they just they get it like and it's beautiful it's like part of it's like frustrating and annoying because you're like when is this going to end because we're not used to it as americans but the other part is like they're literally they're worshiping the father like and they're just in it and that's all they're doing and that's because that's what they came there to do is to worship the father so they don't have a start and end time because again it's uh, africa in the places i went it's more relational so what are you doing you're in a relationship with the father you're 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 praising the father and so it's uh it's usually not a set time thing so if you're a scheduled person it's gonna take some getting used to <laughs> Yeah, the whole, the worship thing is something that I'm going to have to get used to as well. I know it was something I was exposed to a little bit in the the few trips that I've done to Haiti, where they definitely have some longer services there too. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I, I'm really excited for on the World Race is I feel like on those, the past trips that I had, I didn't really let myself open up to just like, accepting it and taking it all in and embracing this worship that that you just described it was more of like okay like it's been two hours now when is this gonna wrap up <laughs> yeah i think worship is one of my favorite parts about the world race as, as a whole because like at training camp you'll get a taste of what how we worship and it's is awesome it's beautiful but then when you go to different parts of the world and see how they worship, because it's, it's very different, you know, each part of the world is different, but it's also the same heart of worship to the father. Um, but then worshiping in, I think my, I love when it's like, it's a song that we know in English, but they're singing in Spanish or they're singing in Creole or there's, you know, yeah. and you're all like, it's different nations singing the same song, worshiping the same father, but different languages like that. I love that. Like, and you know, I, you know, break every chain, passe uchen. I just remember that because that's what we sung, like, you know, break every chain, break every, is in Creole, it's passe uchen. And it's like, I just, like, that sticks out in my mind because I was one, a moment where I'm like, this is so powerful. Like, they're, we're singing two different languages and it's it's just beautiful because it's, it's, it's the same heartbeat for the Lord. And I know what you're singing. It's different when they're like, just singing what they're singing. You're like, yeah. I don't know what you're saying, but I'm, 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 I'm here with you. I'm in it. But I can't because I have no idea what you're singing, but then you hear a tune and you're like, I know that tune. I can sing this. And it's, yeah. it's the best. I love it. 
Yeah, I've had a little taste of that with just like, I help lead worship nights with, I mean, I don't care. I don't sing. I bring the word <laughs> and like help lead prayer, but with a girl who's bilingual and like she loves to just like, she'll lead and like once people get the song going, she'll just start singing in Spanish. And like, mm. to me, it's just like the most microchasm, small view of just like revelation, how we're told like all tribes, tongues and nations, like yeah, before the father. And I've also experienced a little bit of the Africa. I have two friends who are missionaries in South Africa and I got to preach at the church last summer. And I was told I was preaching at 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. Little did I know that there's only gonna be like an hour in between there because uh, <laughs> I was gonna preach and then like we we're gonna worship for another three hours and then everybody's gonna go to the streets and start evangelizing. Uh, yep, but yep. it's super beautiful. But question getting into more of like the the depths of like what World Race brought to you. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious to just hear a few ways that like the Lord changed you on your eleven months. Yeah. Great question. Like the, the biggest thing. So I remember I was, I remember talking, like I said, I talked at five or more churches uh, leading up to going to the world race. And I remember, you know, I was describing the trip and I was like, it's, this is going to be awesome. Like I'm going to go to all these different nations. I'm going to be preaching and teaching and bringing people to Christ and evangelizing and loving on people and being the hands and feet of Christ. Like all these things that like I was going to be doing. Um, and then when I got back from the race and I was talking at the same church about my experiences, I realized like it was, it was less about what I was going to do and more of what God did in me as I was doing those things. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, I think that's the biggest thing that most people walk away from the world race with is that, that aspect of identity. Like, what's it mean to be a son and daughter of a most high God? What's it mean to, to walk in your identity of who the Lord called you to be? What's it mean? What giftings and talents has he instilled in you for the kingdom, for the good of the body of Christ? And like, how do you walk that out in the midst of, of community and of just doing your life? Um, and so I realized like you get to do all these things, go to all these places, but it's in your, your willingness and saying yes to do those things. And in doing those things, the Lord changes you and he challenges you and your faith grows deeper. Um, and again, lies are, are, are broken off and truth comes and you walk at, even in more of your identity than you did before. And so the biggest thing for me was the aspect of my identity in Christ is What's it mean to be a man of God? What's it mean to be a son of God and walking in those things? Again, it's, it was the identity piece that I didn't realize I was going to get that when I walked away, I realized like that, that's life changing because, you know, yes, it's, it's life changing to, to share the gospel and bring people to Christ. Like absolutely um, to love on people. But um, if you are changed, then for the rest of your life, you get to bring that change to other people. You know, if you've walked out of a line into a truth or realize the truth of the father, you get to share that with other people for the rest of your life. And so there's so much more of an impact in my identity that was rooted in the father that I've been building off of that identity for the past eight years. Um, and that's priceless um, on so many levels. So that was my biggest walk away and a big part of why I love doing what I do is because people walk away with a greater sense of identity in the father and who they are in him and what it means to be a son and daughter of God. Um, and you, you know, again, you can't put a price on that. Like that's, it's just awesome. And beautiful. Yeah. Ah, this is also encouraging and exciting. And I'm just sitting here thinking like, <laughs> when do we leave again? Like, come on, man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, uh, it's also so good to hear. Um, so awesome. What happened after you got back? Like how, I know you, you talked about how your identity kind of changed, but what happened mm -hmm. like in your world back here once you, you returned from your world race trip? Yeah. So my experience is not the majority, I would say. So I came, I mean, I had a whole plan in my mind from day one of like, all right, I'm doing the world race and then I'm doing this program and then I'm going to get a job and I'm going to know what my life is. And I'm just going to do it. It's like, it's like I, you know, and God, you know, I, the way that making plans without the Lord in it, in my mind, the way I picture it is like a toddler playing with little building blocks. 
and stacking them up. And then God just looking at it like, oh, that's cute. <laughs> because you were building a castle out of blocks in front of you, but behind you is this amazing castle that's 500 feet tall and has 175 rooms that the Lord built for you and you just didn't realize it, you know, because that was his plan for you. So it's like making your own plans without the Father is just, it's comical. I think he laughs at us, honestly. (laughs) Um, because he's like, don't you realize that I I know better? Like, want, like do this with me. <laughs> um, so I had plans and they didn't work out. But um, I knew that coming out of the world race, like, again, it was that identity aspect. Like, I wanted more discipleship. I wanted to learn more of what it meant to walk in my identity and to be discipled and to grow in my faith. And so for me, I came home and did uh, Adventures and Missions, our discipleship program, which is our second year program after the world race called the Center for Global Action, or the CGA. And um, so I actually did that when I came home from my trip, because what they offered was leadership development and discipleship and growing in the intimacy of the Father and all these things. And I'm like, that's what I, I want more of it, you know, and I want to live in community with people because I learned that I love living in community with other believers. And so like, um, so I only went home for uh, about a month before I moved down to Georgia and started in our, in our discipleship program. Oh, wow. Um, and so I was, again, like I, I stepped into the culture of the kingdom and adventures and missions, and I never really stepped out of it. So, because I did that program and I came on staff and I've led several trips over the years, but I've been here since then. So my experience is not necessarily typical. Um, but it was beautiful. And it was because that's, that's what the Lord was leading me into. And that's what I wanted. Like, I was like, I want more of this discipleship. I want more of this interest with the father. Like, and these people have it. Like I just spent a year doing this. But I want, I like, I want more. And so that's what I chased after. So that was my experience. Um, but again, that's not, I mean, most people don't move to Georgia and stay here the rest of their lives. <laughs> so. Do you still keep in touch with the people that you did your race with? Um, to some extent. So a couple of people that I did my race with actually work, work at adventures as well. Um, so it's hard because I'm, I'm one of those people that it's, I have such great community where I'm at. It's hard to keep in touch with everyone who's gone. And also since I did my world race trip, I've led a world race trip myself. So I got really close to that group of people over the five months that I led them. I've mobilized hundreds and hundreds of world racers who I get to know at training camps and, and all that sort of stuff. And, so I, I know so many people that it, like, it's impossible for me to keep up with them. But um, like a few of them, I'm actually reaching out like with everything going on with, you know, COVID and, you know, being working from home for so long. I'm like, I've been reaching out to a lot of different people that I haven't talked to in a while. And it's so refreshing and encouraging to even, you know, two, three, five, eight years that I, I haven't talked to some of these people. And I'm like, it's good just to catch up on life, like what, what you're doing, what I'm doing and that sort of thing. So, um, I, a small, small percentage of my squad, I keep up with. And then the same smaller percentage of the people that actually led on the world race. Um, and then a few people here in between, but I have such great community here. Um, my capacity to continue relationships, um, is a lot harder. It, It takes a lot of intentionality. Um, so yeah. It would be different if like I moved home and I didn't have good community where I was at at home. And like, I need that connection with people because I didn't have it where I was. Um, so again, my experience, a little bit different than most people's, but um, I have kept up with a select few of them. That's awesome. Yeah, that's definitely interesting. Interesting to hear. Yeah. Was there ever a country that you didn't want to leave that you went on? Yep. Um, so I shared this, uh, I think on a zoom call, but, um, there's one country and it was because of the ministry and the people, not the country. Um, so usually most people experience, um, this on their trip to some extent It's like you, you are part of a ministry or you meet, a, a people or a person that just impacts you greatly, um, just deeply and down, down to your soul and your bones, you know, and, it's so hard to walk away from that after, you know, just a month of, of knowing that person or that ministry or whatever the, the case may be. Um, you know, 
it's really fun going for to different country every month for the first four or five months. It, it, it does start to get old after a while. Cause you're like, you're picking up and you're leaving, you're making relationships and then you're leaving. And so like the, uh, the glamor of it does wear off. Um, that will happen even though it, at the beginning you're like, you're so pumped and excited and like, this is never going to be dull. This is going to be awesome for the next 11 months. It does wear off. Um, but it can be hard to leave. So I was in India, which is the most foreign place I've ever been in my life. Um, out of all the places I've been to 35 or so countries at this point, and India is by far the most foreign, just culturally different, the dress code, the, the religions that are all there, the, the cultural dynamics, men and women, everything. It's just, it's foreign. Um, and most people like love or hate it. Most people were like, I could never go to India again and I would be a happy camper. Um, and other people just fall in love with it. And so I don't know if I love the culture. India was great. Indian food, fantastic. Love Indian food. I mean, I pretty much love all food. Um, <laughs> it's like I love, I love street food traveling. It's great. Um, but in India, we worked with a special needs orphanage. And um, in India, there's a caste system. So you know, you have different levels of cast of people. And at the bottom, you have the untouchables, the people that, you know, are literally worse than trash. You ignore them. You don't acknowledge that they're actually human beings or anything. And and so, um, and this specific ordinance worked with uh, children and young, uh, well, children from, you know, infants all the way up to their teen years, um, of people who are have a physical or mental handicap. And in the Indian culture, or at least in the, the state or, or area that I was in, they are untouchable. And so they're literally, literally thrown out with the trash sometimes um, because a lot of their belief is in reincarnation. And if you're born with a physical or mental defect, it's because you deserved it from something you did in your past life. So it all plays into the culture. Um, and so this orphanage was started by a, an American woman who saw the need for this people group that's literally just being abused and thrown out and not cared for and so she started this orphanage and um very long story short we went in there's about five of us and there's a hundred and some of them and their caretakers and uh it's if you've never worked with physical and or mentally handicapped individuals it's it can be very draining um it's it's new it's different and it's in a a, a country that is very foreign and different too and so uh, we went there and our first day, like very overwhelming, super overwhelming. And so like the only way that I could cope in this situation was choosing one, one child and like, all right, one, I can, I can love on this one. Cause there's, there's hundreds or not hundreds, but there's about a hundred. Um, and so I just picked up this little girl. She was maybe two years old and I just played with her, loved on her, prayed over her, sang to her. Um, and after a couple of days of doing that ministry, I was like, Jesus, I can't do this. Like, Lord, um, I'm going to need you to show up. Like, for me, it was a, not necessarily a breaking point, but I was like, this is hard. Like, to see the kids in the in these situations, and there's there's so many of them, so few of us, and a lot of them are just laying in their beds, and, and no one's interacting with them or playing with them. I mean, it was just, it was heartbreaking. And I was like, Lord, I can't do this. Like, I need, this is like, I literally can't do this without you. And so my prayer became, Lord, would you give me eyes to see these kids as you do? Because, you know, they, a lot of have mental and physical handicaps. And so it's, it's not pretty, you know, there's, you know, it's a lot of drooling and a lot of everything else. And there's so few caretakers. And so it's like, we're helping to take care of them and everything. So like, Lord, help me to see them as you do with your eyes. And Lord, would you give me your love for them? Because I am spent after 20 minutes with them and we have to be there for hours and hours on end. And so that was my prayer. I was like, Lord, give me your eyes and give me your heart for, for these kids because I know you love them. They're your creation. And the Lord did such a work in me that month. Um, and it was that little girl I picked up on the first day that I spent a lot of my time with is like the Lord just broke my heart. And it was the hardest thing I had to do in my entire life is to walk away from her at the end of the month. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I remember I walked away, I was just bawling. I walked away three times. Like I walked away once and got to the door and like turned around and went back <laughs> and like walked away and like got a little farther and then I went back and then I walked away a third time. I was like, I just, I just gotta like run away from this orphanage. Cause I, 
it's it was so hard to to leave them and specifically this this little girl whose name was was uh, uh winnie and um the lord did such a work in my heart that month and it he showed me you know austin like he gave me a heart for this child that i'm assuming is like a father for for their their son or daughter i don't have kids yet so i don't know but i'm assuming like i've never felt this kind of love for someone before and i'm assuming it's it's like the love of the father and so the father said like you know austin like just as much as you love her like i love you the same way like there's nothing she can do for you there's nothing that she can she could like she can literally just lay there in her bed and do nothing and yet you love her so much like that's how i love you mm. like, there's nothing you can do or say that's going to make me love you more or less like i love you because you're my creation you're my son and so like it was this beautiful heart work that the lord did in me that just paralleled like me to her and then him to me um and again i've never felt that kind of, of love before and so hardest thing to do is to walk away at the end of that month and to leave um that country because my heart just broke um but i knew that the lord called me to the world race like he didn't call me to to stay there and to 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 love on her because that's you know i don't i eventually i'd have to go home <laughs> so like he you know i knew i had to entrust her back to him. like the lord trusted her to me for a month and i had to hand her back and say all right lord i trust that you're going to send other people to, to love on this one out of the hundred that are here i trust that you are going to take care of her you are going to provide for her you are mm -hmm. going to protect her um and i had to release her back to the lord and that in itself was a, another work of the heart that it took me a couple months to kind of process that with the lord but um so india to answer your question was uh, <laughs> the hardest place to leave specifically because of the work the lord did me with my ministry and and with winnie yeah, that's gonna be super hard for me because i work for people with special needs i work with people with special needs like the little boy i have now i've been with him for three years yeah. so it's gonna be hard to leave him for a year even though like i will be back but it's still gonna be a very different setting when i leave him for a year yeah it's just another step of faith and that's something you have to walk with the lord it's like how do you entrust someone back to the lord especially when they're not yours you know um mm -hmm. until you have your own kids like then they're entrusted to you until they're old enough to uh, to be adults and go out on their own and then you have to trust them back to the lord you know but um you know everyone that you meet you're like i may never see this person again and so you have to say all right lord i I'm on my journey and I'm trusting you in that and I'm trusting you with, you know, these people that I'm also leaving behind. What was the weirdest food that you tasted uh, while on your journey? Always a question. Um, <laughs> I honestly didn't eat a whole lot of weird stuff. Like I had fresh milk, like right from the cow. Um, oh, it, was, it was like boiled. It was, so it was like boiling hot. Um, but it was like they literally just milked it, boiled it and handed it to us, which it almost was like drinking macaroni and cheese because it was like, it's because it was full fat it was like creamy and like yeah. and it was, it was weird um <laughs> but that was tripe uh which it takes stomach or pig uh, intestine not great um <laughs> i don't recommend it personally uh koi which is uh uh guinea pig um tastes a lot like chicken um I never, there's, you, most people who go to Asia, like you on the street, you get like tarantulas and snakes and all sorts of stuff. I never really ate those things. I'm like, I have no idea where these things came from. And these are for the tourists. And I bet, I guarantee you the locals do not eat these things. But <laughs> the tourists will, add, will will pay, you know, three bucks for a, a tarantula on a stick. And I'm like, no, no, I don't, I don't, I don't need to do that um alligator bugs like like in asia there's like like fried bugs like you know which again that's very normal ish you know protein um <laughs> i almost ate balut so that's the i think that's the one i'm semi regretful of so in the philippines there's balut which is a fertilized duck egg that is um uh I don't know. I think it's brined in water and maybe aged to some extent. I don't remember off the top of my head. But duck egg fertilized, meaning there's an embryo in there that's that it's a partially formed duck inside of this egg that's maybe like this big. 
So when, and it's like a typical, um, it's just like a street food snack and you crack it open and um, you eat, it's like a hard boiled egg. So it's hard boiled, but then inside of it is like a partially formed duck. And so you, you eat that. Um, I was kind of excited to try that, but like the day that my team did it, like I was, I was sick and there was no way I was going to be able to keep down something like that because I couldn't keep anything else down. So I did not get a chance to do that in the Philippines, but I was, that was one thing, like the whole time I was like, I knew about this going into the Philippines. I was like, I want to try this at some point and it it didn't happen. (laughs) Well then we're going to jump into our segment here, the word of the week. And Andrew's going to bring the word tonight. Take it away, Andrew. Yeah, so this is a dangerous spot for me, y'all. I could talk for like 30 minutes. <laughs> I'll keep it short. There's like four things that I was deciding between sharing. There's something in Genesis 2 and 3 that's been like really on my heart. Something in Acts 3 and 4 that's been really on my heart. And then I'm like reading through First and Second Kings. But we're going to talk about none of that. <laughs> and we're going to talk about something that actually – uh came up while I was just playing volleyball talking to a friend um something that I know I've shared with Micah and Zaya before but it is just like looking at um John 4 and the story of the woman at the well and so just like first context is that ready to blow your mind John 3 become comes before John 4 and so in John 3 Nicodemus is like comes to Jesus in secret like Jewish leader and starts asking Jesus all these academic questions. And then we get like the famous John three sixteen for God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. But like something that more recently in the past couple of years I've questioned is like, why didn't Jesus say for God so loved the world that he sent me? Like he intentionally went out of his way to not tell Nicodemus that he was the Messiah and just answer his academic questions. Then we fast forward to John 4, and there's this random woman at the well, and Jesus goes across all kinds of cultural boundaries to talk to this woman, and it is like the easiest gospel presentation ever. He starts telling her about living water, and the woman's like, yes, I want it. Where can I get it? And instead, Jesus asks her this really weird question that is like, go get your husband. And the like, it's really easy to look at that from like an American culture and just be like, Like if someone were to do that today, that would be like extremely offensive to like bring up this woman's shame because right, the reality of this woman is that she's had five husbands and the man that she lives with now actually isn't her husband. But there is this like beauty that comes in that story of the fact that like Jesus refused to let the gospel be anything short of healing this woman's deepest shame and her like deepest like self image issues. and like he, he like made sure the gospel was healing that it wasn't just some like easy believism and so he shares this with her and then like what comes next i think is a huge difference between this woman and nicodemus and the reason why i think what happens after this comes and this woman responds by saying like i can tell you here from the lord you must be a prophet like obviously he just told you everything about you and he's never met you But her question then is about like how to worship the Lord. And so when confronted with like a man who is clearly hearing from the Lord, even in her eyes, her first question isn't like, why do bad things happen to good people? Like, what are the lottery numbers for tomorrow? (laughs) This woman's first question is like, how can I worship the father in a way that pleases him? And then Jesus's response, talking about the, she asked a question about the Messiah. And he says, I who speak to you am he. And it's the first person in all of scripture that like Jesus reveals his messianic identity to. It's not the disciples. It's not Nicodemus, which like if he won Nicodemus, you would think popularity standpoint, like Jewish ruler, thousands of people would have heard the gospel. It's this random woman at the well whose heart was to like worship the father. But then like the, the second piece of it that I had like always been told my whole life that This woman was most likely a whore. Like she was jumping from man to man to man, bed to bed to bed, like looking at that through an American view. But like the reality of this woman is that like culturally there is like no chance that's who this woman was. Like she was a woman in first century Middle East, like her punishment for divorce literally would have been being stoned to death. Like 
that's the culture she lived in. And so the reality of this woman isn't that she was a whore jumping from man to man to man. Like she was a reject who had married five men and five times she had given everything she had. And five times that men said like, you're not good enough for me. Like the depths of you, your intimacy, like you are not worthy of my love. Get out of my house. I don't know if I had to guess, I would guess this woman was probably barren. That was her issue. We have no idea if that's true or not. But all we know is like culturally, like there is no way that this woman was the one divorcing the men. Like she was, was a reject. And I think for me, why that like is so grips my heart is it's hard for me to relate to the woman who's jumping from man to man to man. Like there are plenty of stories all throughout scripture of like, instant massive change of people that like we view as living in crazy depravity i mean like look at paul in a second goes from persecuting christians to like jesus comes before him or he's blinded like has a dude come and heal him and like walks instantly into ministry but like for me the way that i have described this is like i didn't grow up as a kid like in a gang having sex getting drunk doing drugs any of that like i would tell you i grew up what was much more dangerous is I was like a good kid. And so that meant like I had all the answers. It meant that like I could tell you what you wanted to hear. And like I had a good resume of being like good athlete, captain of the soccer team, all this stuff. Like from the outside looking in, my life was like great and I didn't need Jesus. And so like <laughs> it's hard for me to relate to the woman at the well who is jumping from man to man to man. But it's really easy for me to relate to the woman at the well who is seen as a reject. Like I know what it's like to give my everything to something and find out that it's not good enough. But then like the beauty of this story is not just that like Jesus meets this woman, but like in one moment, this woman's entire past of shame and like regret and all of these things she was walking in, in like one moment, it's gone. This woman turns around and runs into a city and we're told that this whole town is safe. Like, and the like, she doesn't she's an uneducated woman has no theology we're told this whole town is saved because she simply says i met a man who told me everything about myself come and meet him and so like my encouragement for you would be to like the beauty of what it is to simply share testimony like it is not <laughs> evangelism is not backing somebody into a theological corner like it's not bad to understand theology and have like a great understanding of scripture but like that alone is not evangelism. Like we're told in Revelation that like we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Like that blows my stinking mind to think that like, and the word of our testimony is included in that. Like we are called to be a people who share. And so like with that, it is like, <laughs> I would just love for everybody to hear that like, you don't have to have all of the answers. You don't have to have some perfect theology. Like the world doesn't need more people who have like this perfect script to like back people into a theological corner. What the world needs is people who suck at sharing the gospel to do it, to like share their stories and share how they've seen Jesus move. Because like, that is the way that like actually points to Jesus. And like even further, if you want to go, I'll go one step further, like Ephesians four <laughs> talks about the role of evangelists. Like it talks about evangelists, prophets, teachers, shepherds, and I forget the apostles and like they are all within the context of the body so like the role of the evangelist is not to go and evangelize for you because they have all the theology down like it's within the body that it plays out like the role of the evangelist is to equip you and provoke you to do something with the gospel and so that would just be my encouragement to you it's like two things thinking about where like that woman is at is just like questioning like where in your life do you feel ashamed or feel like you have to put a mask on to come before Jesus? Because like, just like she tries to put a spin on, she says her answer was, I'm not married. Just like the best possible twist you could put on the reality of that situation. And so like, I would ask you to question, like where are areas that you try and like put on a mask? Because like the Lord won't meet you with your mask on. Like he will require you take that mask off and to be you and like in my life I have found everywhere that I am putting on a mask is like always rooted in just simply not believing that he is good in that area of my life and believing that like what he has is better and best and so that's question one 
And then like my encouragement would be to share, like whether you think your story is like crazy and influential or not, like we are called to share. And I promise you like just in simply sharing testimony that points to Jesus, like that is where amazing things are going to happen. Not in having all the perfect answers. Yeah, that's good. I think, I think the beauty of that is that it's, the heart of the father is about restoration and redemption. Like that's a story of Christ. Yeah, it's restoration and redemption. It's like, that's what the Lord uses to bring people to Christ. Like again, it's not beating them into submission with theology or we're saying like, look at what you've done, you know, beating people over the, the face with their sin, but he's about restoration and redemption, which can only come through love and the power of the Holy spirit. Um, I think the beauty of testimony is is um, one of my mentors, Dion. Uh, I remember he he said this to us, and it just stuck with me. Is the word testimony? If you go back to the original language, uh, Greek or Hebrew, I don't remember. Um, it literally means "do it again, Lord." Mm-hmm. And so, when you are giving your testimony, or when you like in Revelation, when it talks about by the word of our testimony, like. You're literally saying, do it again, Lord. When you're sharing your testimony, which, side note, if in, especially in Africa, but in other cultures, when they say, hey, we want you to share a testimony today in church, usually that doesn't mean your life story. Yeah. In the American context, it usually means like, what's my testimony? Oh, well, I was born in a Christian family and I grew up in the church <laughs> and I blah, blah. Like, in reality, testimony is just like, what did the Lord do for you today? What did the Lord do for you this week? How did he show up in your mm-hmm. life? Because they'll meet daily and people are giving testimonies every day. Um, people go up every day and give a testimony in front of the church. And you come to realize like they're just, all they're going to do is sharing what did the Lord do in their life today, yesterday, this past week. And in the process of sharing that, they're basically saying, look what the Lord did in my life. All right, Lord, do it again. Like, this is you. This is what you've done. You're a God who is faithful. And so do it again, Lord. This is the testimony of who you are. You are the same as you were, as you are, and as you will be. So do it again. And so by sharing your testimony, you're saying like, Lord, you showed up and did this. Do it again, because that's your character. And so I think that's that's the beauty of testimony. And I didn't realize the depth of that verse in Revelation until I learned that. And I realized like, it's literally just about any any little thing the Lord did in your life today. like that's going to bring people to Christ because it's going to reveal the character of God and who he says you are, who he is in in my life, and then who he can be in your life if you only knew him, you know? And this is the same thing you can have too. So hmm, it's a good word. Yes. Thank you, Andrew. That was so, 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 so good. And so encouraging. Uh, Before we wrap up, Austin, I have one more quick question for you. Um, seen as you're someone who has been through the world race, you've done the 11 country trip, um, and you've been working with Adventures and Missions ever since you got back from your world race trip. What would you tell someone who is looking into the world race or thinking about going on it? And got them. Simple. Um, <laughs> man. That's a good question. What would I tell someone who's looking at it? Um, it's not about us. It's actually, it's not about the world race. I think that's what I tell them. Um, you can go on a journey with the Lord wherever you are. Um, the world race is not the only mission trip out there. The, there are so many different programs out there. There's YWAM, there's long-term shit. You could move to another country and just partner with the ministry. Like, you can do stuff where you're at right now in in America or wherever you are. Like it's not about the world race, but it's about what is the Lord leading you into? And just having, again, like I said before, open hands and open hearts for whatever the Lord has in store for you. The world race, amazing program. It will help you develop your identity, develop intimacy with the Lord, learn what it looks like to walk in, community to walk what's it look like to be the church not the building but me and you guys the body of christ the church what's it look like to be to the church and walk that out and walk in the ephesians 4 like evangelists the prophets that you know what's it look like to walk that together because we're not all eyes we're not all ears we're not all noses we work together as one body with different giftings um and ultimately what's it look like to live your life on mission you know 
because it's not about a trip. Like it's not like the world race. If you look back on the world race and like, man, I did this awesome thing. And that was the best year of my life. You missed it. Cause it's not about the world race. It's not about what you're, what you have done. It's about launching you into what the Lord is calling you into. Whatever that is, the world race will equip you to develop intimacy with the father, to, to dig into scripture, to, learn about your identity, to walk in community and to learn what's it look like to, for my life to be a mission and mission to be my life. Not to have an on and off switch for my faith, but to be in the grocery store and be in tune with what the Father's doing. To be in church and to be in tune with what the Father's doing. To be in another country and realize the, the Lord is working and what is he doing, whether I'm out at ministry or I'm on my off day and I'm just, you know, rafting the Nile River with my friends. You know, what's it look like to live your life in a place that you are, it's, you're so walking in intimacy with the Father that it doesn't matter what, where you are, what you're doing, you're living your life in a way that's bringing kingdom. Um, that's part of what the world race helps to equip people to do is to walk out a kingdom lifestyle. Um, but we're not the only place that does that and we're not right for everybody. <laughs> like you need to follow the Lord because there are so many awesome programs. So we're, we don't have a, a license on the kingdom. You know, other people are doing some amazing stuff in the world. Um, but we have a pretty cool program and we, we do what we do for a reason because it, it works. It, you know, if you have willing hands and willing hearts, to follow the Lord and to, to walk in humility, the Lord can use you and he will use you. We're one avenue to do that, but by no means are we the only one out there. Man. Andrew is there. Did you guys tell him to say that? Cause that was like <laughs> perfect. <laughs> it's like that just goes right along with pretty much our very reason for starting this podcast. You know, the three of us are in this season right now where we're preparing for the world race and we're going to be going on the world race. So it's very much so what we're talking about right now. But the whole idea of the podcast is that we want to use it as an avenue for us to share and for people to learn just what you were saying is that you can live a life on mission without doing some super extravagant 11 month mission trip. Like, yeah. Living a life on mission with the Lord is just living out your love for him in everyday life, no matter where you are or no matter what season of life you're in. So that was just about as perfect of an answer as we could get. So thank you so much for sharing that. That was, that was unbelievable. Like, I can't believe you just said that. It's almost like we have the same Holy Spirit living inside of us that, you know, it gives us the same heart for things. It's weird, huh? Yeah, you know, <laughs> kind of crazy how that works. <laughs> right? <laughs> All right. Well, Austin, we so very much appreciate you taking the time tonight to, to dive in and join us here on the podcast. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you. It's it's been a pleasure. I lo like, I love doing what I do. You know, I love working with you guys. You know, obviously, but I I love the heart of adventures and missions and what the world race does. Um, again, we're not the only ones doing kingdom work out there, but I just I love what we do. So sharing it, you know, it's a joy. Obviously. All right, that's going to be all for us this week, folks. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the More Than a Mission podcast. We'll see y'all next week. See ya. We want to thank you for listening to More Than a Mission. For more information and to keep up with our ministries, follow us on social media at More Than a Mission Podcast or email us directly at more than a mission at outlook.com.